afternoon, everybody. I am very, very happy to be with my former professor and advisor, uh, Dr. Eugene Webb. And he's been gracious enough to discuss his work, which I think will be of um, real relevance to many of you. So with that, uh, Dr. Webb, could you just give a sketch of your, your career and your background? Uh, yes, uh, it's a it, my my own career, my my background, uh, professional life, uh, has been extremely unusual, um, and fortunately, I, I was able to get away with it. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was a very strange life. Um, I majored in philosophy as an undergraduate. I found the uh, the, the the kind of the, the the style of analytic philosophy that was fashionable at the time, and uh, UCLA, where I studied, was a, a major center of it. Uh, Rudolf Carnap taught there, for example. Um, I, I found it, well, uh, pretty dry and, and uh, didn't seem to offer what I was looking for. I thought I would find something more like the philosophical interests that I had in uh, the study of literature, uh, especially French literature was filled with uh, interest in philosophy at, at that time. Uh, and so uh, in graduate school, I, I studied English and French literature, got my PhD in comparative literature. Uh, when I got out, I had to find a job. So I uh, uh, got a job in an English department uh, and um, Eventually, I also became a member of the comparative religion, uh, comparative literature faculty. But uh, when I, after I'd been in the English department, about see, I started at UW in the, in the spring of nineteen uh, no no in the autumn of nineteen sixty six, uh, and uh, in um, in the the spring of 1973, something happened that changed my life considerably. Uh, during that, well, uh, in um, towards the end of the academic year of 1972, there was a, a meeting in the hub uh, with, to which all faculty at the university were interested, were invited. Uh, the meeting was uh, hosted by a committee that had been formed by the dean to study the feasibility and desirability of having the study of religions at the University of Washington. Uh, the reason why uh, they had to have such a meeting and why it came so comparatively late was that the, um, you know, the state constitution in, in the state of Washington uh, had a prohibition against using public funds for um, religious instruction. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, the university had never had a program to study the religions of the world. Uh, although, ironically enough, uh, in the Asian languages and literature department, you couldn't very well study Asian language literature unless you had Buddhism in there. And so they had a course on Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Near East department, uh, you can't study much of anything in the way of uh, Near Eastern literature without uh, Islam. So they had courses having to do with that kind of thing. Um, uh, but uh, Judaism and Christianity were ruled out. Uh, so they had that meeting. And on the way home, driving home from the meeting, uh, I was just thinking, well, let's say there was such a program, what might I contribute to it? Uh, and I started thinking about all the books that I was interested in. And I, I got the idea on the way home of writing uh, the book um, that's entitled The Dark Dove, The Sacred and Secular in Modern Literature. Uh, my idea there was to take uh, the phenomenology of the sacred that was uh, uh, an approach to religion that was developed by uh, Rudolf Otto and then by Merce Eliade. Eliade wrote a book called The Sacred and Profane, which I, I used to teach very often after I started comparative religion. But uh, at any rate, I, I got the idea for that book uh, in, in which I included a whole lot of modern authors uh, and, uh, and from uh, all kinds of places too. Uh, um, I had, um, uh, well, Thomas Mann, for example, James Joyce, uh, T.S. Eliot, W.H. Auden, 
uh, Samuel Beckett was in there, Ibsen, um, all kinds of people. So it was really comparative literature. And that, in fact, because I wrote that book that I was asked if I would join the comparative literature faculty. Um, but at any rate, uh, I, I, I'd written the manuscript. And one day I was uh, in, in the spring of 1973. Yeah, the spring of 1973, I um, was um, eating lunch uh, by myself at a table in the faculty club. And one of the older members of the department, uh, David Fowler, uh, came along and sat down with me. Uh, and and just said, you know, can I sit down? And so we started chatting and he asked me what I've been working on. So I told him I had this manuscript that I, uh, finished writing and I submitted it to the press uh, and I described it to him. And then when I got back to my office after lunch, he, he called me up and uh, said he was on this committee for the study of the feasibility and desirability of having a, a, a program in the study of religions at UW and that they had been given um, authorization by the Dean of Arts and Sciences to hire someone who was a specialist in the field uh, to come and um, uh, organize the program, but they had a difficulty. The difficulty was that the governor at that time, Dixie Lee Ray, had imposed a hiring freeze on all state agencies so that they couldn't actually hire anyone. Uh, by the time the hiring freeze was lifted, which was, it had been lifted at the time he, told, he talked to me, um, uh, by the time it was lifted, they had, had a, a search, uh, they had selected four leading candidates and all of those leading candidates had taken other jobs. They were just, you know, so late uh, getting out any offer. Uh, and so uh, they decided that they were kind of in a hurry to try and get something started. So they thought they'd look inside the, the university to see if there was anybody who would be willing to organize the program and then turn it over to a specialist uh, a year later. Um, and uh, so uh, Dave Fowler called me and asked me, would I be willing to do this? And I said, no, I never wanted to be involved in administrative work. And, and I, I just liked being a professor teaching, doing my own writing and so on. And so um, uh, I said, no. And I called my wife and I told her what he had asked me. And she said, are you sure? because uh, she knew I'd always been interested in religion, uh, I, in all the religions of the world, really. It had always been a, a great interest of mine. I, I was interested in Buddhism, for example, before I ever got interested in Christianity, Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, and so uh, uh, I thought, well, gee, maybe I, maybe I would like to do something like that. Although there was also the odd situation that I had a sabbatical coming up. Uh, I, at the, at the end of that academic year, I was going to have a year of sabbatical, and yet I was being asked if I would do the work of organizing this thing uh, during my sabbatical year. Uh, but uh, strangely enough, I, I agreed to do it. And uh, well, the, the outcome of it eventually was that uh, people liked what I was doing, uh, the way I was running the program. Uh, so they didn't feel a need to go and hire somebody from outside. I was asked if I would just keep on heading the program, which I did for a dozen years. Um, and uh, I ended up shifting most of my teaching to teaching courses in that program mm -hmm. uh, and uh, continued doing that for the rest of my career. Although I, I had a joint appointment in comparative literature and I dropped the appointment in the English department. All my salary went to the, well, what's now called the Jackson School of International Studies. Uh, and uh, it, it, it essentially had the effect of making me my own boss uh, because I really wasn't responsible to anybody except whoever the director of the uh, uh, Institute for Comparative Foreign Area Studies uh, or Jackson School uh, was. And uh, I think on the whole, they they always figure they didn't really quite know what it was I did, but I seemed to be doing a lot of it. Uh, and uh, so I, I was treated pretty well and, and given absolute freedom to do anything I wanted. So 
after The Dark Dove, which was my last literary book, um, I, I wrote a, a couple of essays uh, but uh, in literature, but uh, after that, uh, uh, part, part of the uh, starting up that program, the, the, the Dean of Arts and Sciences gave me some money to use to bring in people who were prominent figures uh, who might be of interest to the faculty generally who, who had something to say about the, the study of religions. And uh, so I invited Merce Eliade, for example. Um, I, I invited quite a few people, um, Walter Ong, um, but also uh, one of them was Eric Vogelin. And it, it, I, I had not read much of Vogelin. I had read Israel and Revelation, the first volume of his order in history, uh, because I got interested in that when I was preparing my course on, on Western religious traditions from ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt up through, uh, well, uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam. And uh, yeah, so I invited him uh, and uh, he was busy uh, doing something, uh, vis visiting professor in Texas and so he said no. Uh, but the following year, uh, one of the people, it was a good friend of mine, Rodney Kilcup, who started the uh, History of Ideas program, was interested in Vogelin. And he said, well, why don't you invite Vogelin again? And I said, well, I, I wrote to him and he turned, turned us down. Uh, why don't you write to him? So Kilcup wrote to him. And uh, he said, yes, he co he'd come. Well, when, when Vogelin came, I ended up going with him all over campus when he would have meetings with various faculty groups. And of course, I went to all of his lectures. And often people would have questions uh, for him. And uh, I, in the meantime, had read a little bit more, but not a whole lot of his work. But I understood what he was talking about. Uh, and so uh, I ended up doing a lot of explaining of what he meant to people when they asked questions. And Vogelin appreciated this he, he, because, uh, well, I guess my English was more adroit than his. And uh, he. Um, he said to me one night as we were driving home for one of these meetings, you know, we understand each other. Um, well, so anyway, he, he went back back to uh, Palo Alto. He lived on Stanford's campus at the time. Uh, and um, uh, oh, uh, a week or two later, I got a phone call uh, from a, a guy who was a former student of Oglin's who was organizing a a symposium for the American Political Science Association on what Vogelin thought. And uh, he needed someone to talk about Vogelin's theory of revelation. And he said that Vogelin had recommended me for it. Uh, so uh, I agreed to do that. And uh, to do that, I had to read everything he'd written, uh, which was an enormous job. Uh, and I, I voted by my whole summer that year, uh, the summer between 73 and 74, or no, it was 74 to 75, uh, to uh, uh, reading all of, all of the order and history and all of his other work. Uh, and um, uh, at the end of it, I had dinner with him in Chicago uh, at the, the meeting of the Political Science Association. And, I suggest what I said to him. What, what would you think if I wrote a book about you? Now that I've done all of this reading of your work, and he thought that sounded like a good idea, uh, <laughs> and so he encouraged me, and and uh, I I then began writing that book. It took me about three years, I think, to to write it. During that time, uh, I often went down to Palo Alto and and visited him. My wife, uh, family lived in in Hayward. Uh, so when we would go visit her family, I would, uh, and sometimes we together with our children, we'd go over to the Vogelin's house. Um, and um, so I, I had, a, and he, we used, he and I used to talk on the phone a lot. Uh, and so I was quite immersed in him and I found him very helpful to, in my thinking. Um, so that's how I got started writing stuff outside of the field of literature. So, the Eric Vogel and philosopher of history began uh, that process and led to philosophers of consciousness because yes. I found that anyone who was interested in him and in Bernard Lonergan, who was somebody I've been interested in before Vogel, uh, were usually interested in Michael Polanyi and, 
and uh, um, I, I thought, uh, why don't I, uh, and, and Paul Ricoeur, for example, uh, why don't I write about them? And, and that eventually expanded what I put in a chapter on Kierkegaard. Uh, and uh, I also put in a chapter, I ended up putting a chapter on René Girard yeah. in there because I became acquainted with his thought uh, a friend of mine in, in the uh, 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 Romance language, a French professor, uh, who was a very good friend of mine, had uh, urged me to read him. And, and Christophides, too, uh, uh, who was the, had been the head of that department, also was in art history, urged me to read him. So I, I, I read Girard and uh, thought his thought was extremely interesting. Uh, so I, I, I wrote about all of those people in Philosophers of Consciousness. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the Girardian interest uh, eventually led to my writing The Self Between, which was about the modern uh, psychological stuff in France, mostly focused on, on uh, Girardian thought, but also uh, Freudian thought and whatever else was of interest over there. Uh, and uh, then eventually I... I, I uh, I, I didn't actually write a book specifically about religion uh, until after I retired. Uh, but uh, before I retired, I, I, th I thought I would start to write a book which was going to be on, on um, uh, religious thought and the psychology of worldviews. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, I was interested in the fact that uh, Carl Jaspers, the philosopher, had written a book called The Psychology of Worldviews. It had never been translated into, into English, but talked about the way um, people's psychology could influence uh, the way they thought about religion. Uh, and, 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 and of course, their worldviews generally. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I decided to start writing that book. And I started writing it. And there, uh, what I wrote during that, I had a sabbatical year, uh, 19. Uh, 96 to 97. Uh, and uh, I wrote the first part of the book, which was a psychological part of the book. Uh, and uh, uh, then I was asked if, if I would be the associate director of the Jackson School when I came back. And I did. And I just dropped the book, uh, put it aside. Uh, and, and then I retired. Uh, and then I went on teaching for five years, uh, part-time after I retired. Uh, and it wasn't until I finished that five years of part-time teaching, I decided to take up that book again and, and finish it. And then I wrote the religion part of the book, uh, which uh, eventually is called Worldview and Mind, uh, Religious Thought and the Psychology of Worldviews. And... Uh, well, I'd always been interested in it. Was, it particular interest of mine from very early on was the symbolism of the triune God, or as it's called usually in the West, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, uh, I pr much prefer to call it the symbolism of the triune God. Um, it's, uh, it's a sort of a characteristic of uh, the Western mentality to take symbolism and make some kind of theory out of it, uh, <laughs> which um, I, I think is maybe uh, often misleading. Uh, so uh, that's how I happened to write the symbolism of the, the book uh, In Search of the Triune God. Originally, it was going to be called uh, The Triune God in East. The, the Triune God in East and West, The History of a Symbolism. But um, my publisher thought that it was, um, it sounded too abstract. Uh, and, and uh, one of the readers of the manuscript suggested in, in, in search of the triune God, and I thought, oh, okay, that'll be okay. And I, I had a, 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 an Orthodox archbishop, a uh, friend of mine, uh, to whom I, I sent every, the draft of every chapter when I finished writing it. He was very enthusiastic about the book, and I asked him what he thought about that title, and he thought that would be a good title. So I, I, um, I decided, okay, we'll go with that. So that's what it's called now, In Search of the Triune God. So on the whole, that's, that's the summary of my career. As, as I say, it's a very unusual career. Because, it is a very unusual career. Uh, you know, I, I really changed my field, and I was able to do that and, and, and uh, get paid. 
Uh, and nobody bugged me about why am I not doing the kind of stuff that you're supposed to do yeah. uh, if you're, you know, you're a specialist in, uh, in literature. Well, that's just it. I mean, it took me, it's taken me years to appreciate just how unusual your career is. Um, and that your thinking is really sui generis in a lot of ways because it evolves out of literature into theological, philosophical considerations. Right. Into and by, by the way, I do think that my literary study was enormously helpful to me. I believe this. that, yeah. Because in, in literature, you, 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 when you're reading literary texts, you're, you're looking closely at the, uh, the metaphors and the themes and the imagery uh, and figuring out what kind of patterns there are there, how, how the, the writer has used these things in order to communicate uh, some kind of vision. And so uh, reading religious texts, uh, I, I read them with that kind of interest in mind, whereas unfortunately, uh, especially with regard to the New Testament. Um, in the Middle Ages, uh, in the West, uh, the, and by the way, I, when I was in college, uh, I, was, I, I already felt I needed to expand beyond what they studied at UCLA, the analytic philosophy approach. I wanted to learn about medieval philosophy, and so I hired a uh, former monk uh, to tutor me in Aquinas. Uh, we read Aquinas uh, in Latin uh, um, eight hours a day, five days a week for 10 weeks. Uh, so I, I got a very deep knowledge of, of Aquinas. Um, and and what, what Aquinas was interested in, uh, and uh, ge this was generally true for, for medieval uh, theologians, was they were looking for um, rules to live by. They were looking for laws coming from God, uh, and, and they were also looking for logical arguments to prove their uh, system of authority uh, in, in the religion. Uh, so that, that was a dominant approach there for centuries, uh, but then when you get to the 19th century, um, actually even beginning in the 18th century, but mainly in the 19th century, the focus in, in, in the reading of the New Testament became historical. Uh, and so they all become concerned with, with finding out what really happened uh, that's described there as compared with things that are made up um, in, or at least are imaginative. And uh, I remember one of the books that made a big impression on me Oh, when I was in graduate school, uh, uh, it wasn't part of my program, but what, one of the nice things about studying literature at Columbia was I was given absolute freedom to read anything I wanted. I didn't have to have any exams in any courses, only cumulative exam for the MA, cumulative exam for the PhD, wow. uh, and write a dissertation. Uh, so... I, I had a lot of freedom to read anything I was interested in. And one of the things I read was um, Albert Schweitzer's The Quest of the Historical Jesus, in which he looked back over all the 19th century attempts to try to pin down what actually happened historically and showed how this was not a very successful quest because uh, you just can't, uh, you can't pin that kind of thing down very well. You don't have enough evidence. Um, yeah. and, uh, that that has con, con, that continued in, into right up to today in New Testament scholarship. Although I, uh, from what I, I see in more recent decades, uh, New Testament scholarship really is uh, sort of getting out of that pattern. But uh, since my own approach came at it by way of, of studying it as, as a work of literature, I. I've tended to read it uh, very differently from that, um, you know, did he actually work this or that miracle and things like that. Yeah. So my, my, the way I internalized your work was, um, and so folks, for the audience, I started studying with him in 1992. So this was, um, 
you know, after he had written uh, Philosophers of Consciousness. But I can remember that, you know, you really caught my attention when you kept talking about the way that, you know, for lack of, we can talk about a lot of ways, but intentional operations. Yes. Yes. And yes. so the, the um, or I think that's Lonergan or Vogelin talked about Metaxu. Meta the, yeah, that, that's, that's Vogelin, uh, Metaxu, the between. Yes. Yeah. And so that there's something that we intend objects, but there's also something that seems to be pulling us in a, in a almost a final cause kind of way. Yeah. Uh, and an existential appetite or something. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And Vogelin used the term existential tension. Yeah. Uh, or tension of existence. Uh, Aquine, uh, excuse me, Lonergan uh, used the term um, uh, existential eros. Um, yes. An appetite for, for to be. You're, you're reaching toward becoming, not, not just being as an object to know, but but subjectively to, to do the work of being and, and the actual, our actual being as, uh, as conscious persons uh, is made up, uh, but besides the fact that our body has all this you know, blood circulating and doing the things that it has to do, um, are as um, human beings, conscious uh, beings, uh, it consists of these intentional operations. And um, Lonergan, uh, in his insight, uh, the study of human understanding and his method in theology, uh, works this out in, in uh, very helpful detail. Um, and it includes, it basically begins with uh, attention to experience. Uh, attending to your experience is an operation in which you are intending something that is, you are, it, it, you, your attention bears upon an object. That's what, what intention means, is the reaching towards something. Uh, and that your experience then usually stimulates some kind of desire to understand your experience, to find some kind of pattern of meaning in it. Uh, and uh, so that leads you into questions for understanding. Uh, uh, and there are all kinds of ways of, of finding patterns of meaning. Um, well, I, I, re I remember once one of my teaching assistants when I was teaching literature uh, told one of, one of my students that, uh, that uh, uh, interpretations are a dime a dozen. The question is, uh, can you find some evidence for that interpretation in the text? Uh, so the study of a literary text is the same as the study of something in the sciences. Uh, you get an idea in the sciences, they call that a hypothesis. Um, but then you have to look for evidence uh, that will support your hypothesis. Uh, and um, when you do have that evidence, then you say that you have a theory and a theory in the sciences is not just a an, an idea, it's a verified uh, interpretation. Uh, so when you, 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 you do the process of interpreting your experience, you also then uh, find yourself drawn on to the further question, is this a good interpretation? Mm -hmm. uh, is it an adequate interpretation? Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing to remember with regard to this is that for most of the things that we inquire into, we can never have a final and definite, this is certain, uh, the only possible good interpretation. The Pythagorean theorem would be a nice example of one that really is that. You can, once you, once you manage to prove uh, one of uh, Euclid's uh, theorems, uh, you've got something that, that you can pretty well say that's it. Uh, but uh, with regard to anything, with regard to contingent reality, the world of our ordinary experience, uh, the most you can come up with is a relatively adequate interpretation. Yeah. Uh, and my favorite example of that would be that Newton's physics was a really good interpretation of the motions of the planets with his theory of gravity. Uh, however, he knew quite well, and he was very frank about it, he didn't know what gravity was, all he knew was that they 
they, they have these regularities in their motions. Uh, then Einstein comes along and shows that there's in fact some irregularities there that can't be explained by Newton, or the bending of light around the sun, uh, and um, comes up with an entirely different idea of uh, way of thinking about gravity. So Newton's was, Newton's physics was relatively adequate. Uh, Einstein's is even more relatively adequate. Uh, we don't know that we're at the end of the road yet because actually Einstein's then gets disturbed by quantum theory, uh, and um, you know we're still uh, we're still part of that story. And who knows, centuries from now, all of this may look a little antique. Yeah. Uh, but once once you've come up with an an understanding of reality that's at least relatively adequate and satisfies you. You still have further questions about what you're going to do in this world of reality that you know that leads you on to questions about uh, uh, what's right and what's wrong uh, in, in terms of action uh, to ethics uh, and uh, um, decision. And for, for Lonergan, his essay, The Subject, is a really nice, it's a very short account of how you develop but also the development could go wrong. You, you can not want to attend to your experience. You can not want to really understand it. You can have preconceived ideas you want to defend at all costs and you throw out any evidence that, that might disturb it. Uh, so uh, uh, if, you, if you're faithful to the norms of, um, of real understanding and, and, uh, and truth, uh, and to the, and, and the quest of the good, uh, then you can actually do all these operations openly and authentically, uh, with an open mind, with the fidelity to the uh, to the to truth, and to the quest for the good, and, and you can um, well, um, you, you can satisfactorily make decisions that are honest and uh, and faithful. Uh, and if you do that, you, be, you eventually become what Lonergan calls an existential subject, a fully developed person. Uh, before that, you might be a truncated subject who, who refuses to go there. Yeah. Um, and yet, so, in the book, and by the way, folks, this is the book we're talking about, Philosophers of Consciousness, fantastic book. Um, in the book, we come up against the tension between uh, Lonergan, and I would say mostly Kierkegaard and Girard about what is the ontological status of the subject? Can we intend the subject like any other object? Yeah. And that's, that to me feels like the most fertile part of the book, you teasing out <clears throat> all that. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that to me is is one of the most uh, important questions um, I think that any of us can think about, and uh, it's been a preoccupation of mine for for a long, long time. Uh, you know, one of the big influences on my thought, because I, I think, as I mentioned, uh, I was interested in Buddhism, seriously interested in Buddhism, studied Buddhism, tried to practice uh, Zen meditation. Uh, before I was interested in Christianity, uh, and uh, the key the key idea of Buddhism is uh, that if you pay very careful attention to your experience, uh, you can discover that the the self that you thought was something very real that you have. Uh, it turns out to be um, a kind of fiction uh, that you make up. Uh, and um, for Buddhism, the, the goal is to see through that illusion of, um, <clears throat> of selfhood. Uh, <clears throat> in, in, in Zen, they refer to it as uh, no self uh, or um, anatman or anatta, um, this Atman, this almost atomistic individual self, um, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's something that you imagine about yourself. And uh, once you see through that, you can become um, 
well, you can become liberated from uh, the desires that, that arise in you to try to defend that thing. Um, that self is, is very vulnerable. Um, well, uh, for example, if you lose an election, that's a blow to that self. So you want to fight off, you know, that, that blow. Um, and uh, almost everything we do uh, is affected by this reflex we have to try to uh, defend that, that, that self, uh, to promote its uh, other people's perception of its value and so on. Um, and so, so that, that made a very deep impression on me. And uh, when I met, became a Christian, it, my, it, it carried over in, into my, my Christian thinking. Uh, so that for me, the uh, uh, part of the goal of a, of a life of contemplative prayer is to realize that you don't exist uh, in that sense. Uh, the, there is, from my point of view, the the, the, looking at it as a Christian, and this connects with the idea of, of the triune God. Uh, by the way, uh, you, you probably know that if you read this In Search of the Triune God, you can see that, that my, my own thinking tends to be very much in the Eastern uh, Greek patristic Christian tradition. The Western uh, Christian tradition, which I studied in such depth, in the, at one time, uh, Aquinas, and I, I used to teach, you know, all kinds of Western, I taught courses in, in the history of religious thought, and they were all, you know, courses in Western religious thought, but I, I also, it, it, in, in the 1990s, uh, I started teaching a course on Eastern Christian traditions, which I, I uh, even taught during, uh, regularly during those five years that I went on teaching, um, uh, the Eastern Christian uh, way of thinking is very different from the, from the Western. Uh, one of the key elements in it is the idea of what they call theosis, uh, deification. Uh, and well, one of my favorite Eastern thinkers is St. Maximus the Confessor, a 17th century theologian. Another one is uh, St. Gregory Palamas in the 14th century. Um, but throughout the, their tradition, you've got this idea of the deification as a universal process. Um, Maximus says very explicitly, the purpose of creation is God's incarnation everywhere in everything. And that is a process that's going on everywhere. And to me, this fits very well with um, the kind of scientific worldview we have today. Uh, just recently, I, I read a, a really good book, by the way, I'd recommend it by uh, Brian Greene, a physicist at Columbia, uh, called um, uh, Until the End of Time. He's written another really good book that I read called The Elegant Universe. But uh, this one, Until the End of Time, is cosmological. It, it talks about how everything begins with the Big Bang and where it might be headed. Uh, it also talks about the way people might think about this uh, from the point of view of religion and the arts and things like that. Uh, and uh, he mentions in there that there are a number of uh, physicists who, who've taken up the thought that, that actually I, I, I got myself years ago and even wrote a manuscript about it but never published it because my publisher didn't think that it would work, uh, a philosophical manuscript called The Continuity of Being. Uh, I, I, this was back in the, about 1970. Uh, I, I, I wrote that manuscript, uh, and, and it grew out of the idea that um, explaining how consciousness gets into living beings uh, is a real problem if you think of it as something that gets put into them or comes in from somewhere. Mm. But if you start off with the idea that everything, all of matter has within it a kind of proto-awareness which gradually emerges as uh, the evolution makes it possible for that awareness to be focused through some kind of senses or, or 
apparatus like the like the feelers of a paramecium can tell what's around it uh, because they get disturbed. Um, and then gradually that can develop to uh, having eyes and ears and, and the, the kind of senses that we're more familiar with, which you have in all kinds of animals, including us. Um, all of that makes it possible for awareness to become focused and then for uh, through the central nervous system, the brain and all, to be able to reflect upon um, what you're aware of and think about it and put together questions for understanding and, and uh, relative adequacy of interpretation and things like that. Um, all of that is, is something emergent. And uh, in the, that the Greek patristic tradition, uh, uh, beginning with Irenaeus of Lyon, really, and, and continuing through John of Damascus and, and um, uh, Maximus the Confessor and, and on up through the Hesychast of the 14th century. Uh, that it, uh, it's, it's there every, everywhere. That, that, for example, Palamas, uh, St. Gregory Palamas in the 14th century uh, said, uh, um, uh, to pluma facei pleroi panta, the, the, the spirit, it is said, fills all things. Uh, panta hudekai hotheosis. And also deification is everywhere. Um, the whole, pro from the big bang on, the whole process has been a process of theosis, of the, the gradual incarnation of the divine love. Which by the way, that's an important point. When we talk about God, one of the biggest problems we have is a tendency to interpret the God of the Christian faith and of the Jewish faith and, and the Muslim faith, uh, that Abrahamic God, to interpret that God as though that God were a single, the, the only actual instance of a God. In other words, monotheism is, you have lots and lots of gods uh, that people thought about, but they were all non-existent except for one uh, and that one is um, uh, is our God. Uh, and of course, with thinking that way, you think you have an idea of what a God is. A God is omniscient. A God is all powerful. A God uh, is in control of everything. Um, and um, all of that really comes out of the pagan imagination. That is to say, the mythological imagination that uh, thought about Zeus as being a very powerful figure. And uh, with regard to the triune God, there's a tendency to think of Jesus as sort of like, uh, well, the son of God, the way Dionysus is the son of Zeus. Um, all of that, I think, is misleading. It gets in the way of, 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 of seeing what, what that symbolism really means. Uh, the, the symbolism of the triune God really grows out of the idea of Israel's calling to sonship to God. When God says in Exodus, you know, uh, Moses says, uh, what shall I say to Pharaoh? And, uh, and God says, tell Pharaoh that I want, that Israel is my, Israel is my firstborn son. I want Israel, my son, to, to go free to worship me. Uh, and uh, that's the beginning, really, of the uh, Israelite faith. Um, I mean, you could say it begins with Abraham, but it really becomes defined that way uh, in, um, through Moses and the Exodus. And uh, if you read the Hebrew Bible and look for all, as I did when I was writing and trying, uh, in search of the Triune God, all the references to sons and sonship in the Hebrew Bible, what you find is the Son of God is always, uh, until you get to the eighth chapter of the first book of Samuel, the Son of God is always Israel. Uh, and there's, there are constant references to Israel's failing to live up to that sonship, being called back to it. In Hosea, you've got this wonderful image of Israel is uh, a negligent or a, a recalcitrant son because 
Uh, he stands at the mouth of the womb and refuses to come forth. In other words, he's having to stop being born. Uh, and think of uh, how this connects with Paul's um, uh, eighth chapter in, in, in Romans, where he talks about the entire creation groaning and travail, waiting for the birth of the sons of God. When, yeah. when the earliest Christians called Jesus the son of God, it's very clear to me the only thing they could have meant by that is Jesus is the first person in the history of Israel who's actually lived up to the calling uh, to sonship. Uh, so when they say he's the only begotten son of God, that's what they mean. He's the, the one who has come forth from the womb. He is our elder brother in a way, but we're all called uh, into being sons and daughters uh, of God if the, the divine love, if the one thing we can really know of God, about God from the point of view of the Christian faith is that God is love. And if you live in love, you live in God and God lives in you. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one solid reality of, that we can affirm about God. We can't say anything else with any great confidence. Uh, we can't, for example, expect him to, well, um, uh, by some divine act of power, um, uh, get rid of the COVID-19 virus for us. Um, but we can, through acts of love, we can work at helping each other uh, get through it. Uh, yeah. And that's God's actual action in the world. We are the, the, the hand, well, uh, the arms and legs of God. Uh, in, in the Eastern tradition, one of the, one of the Eastern Christian tradition, one of the images that they like to use is the son and the spirit are the two hands of God, by which God reaches into the world in order to raise the whole world into himself. Mm. And we are, in a sense, um, in a, the, the action of those hands. So power and a misapprehension of what the human being is can lead us down a very different path. Yeah. And, um, and it distorts our theology because this lust for power that we have, we tend to project onto God. Yeah. Um, it, 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 when we make God into such powerful figures because we want God's power to be on our side and we want to be able to use it. <clears throat> and, and in a Girardian sense, we also want to ourselves as individuals be godlike beings in that powerful yes. sense. Yes. Yeah, well, Girard's idea is we tend to make gods out of the other people uh, whose desires we, we unconsciously imitate. Um, they... they we see a, well, we, we see some powerful person who wants such and such and makes us feel we want that too, because we want to actually participate in that person's power. And, and that can also lead us to abase ourselves before the person and be a, be a, a kind of slave to the person uh, because that person has become our God and uh, by, by abasing ourselves, we kind of empty ourselves out and, and allow that person to take over our lives and, and fill us. <clears throat> All of that from, from well, my point of view is, uh, is a uh, false path. And is that false path inevitable? Is it, is it something that all human beings must negotiate? I, I think I think it's not inevitable, uh, but on the other hand, I do think it's something we all must negotiate. Uh, it's a tempt temptation that faces us all. It's a temptation that faces us all because we have this fundamental tendency to interpret ourselves as these atomistic individuals, as this solid core self uh, that's really me, uh, and that I need to defend against all. Uh, possible dangers and that I need to, to promote in order to, to have power. Um, uh, that's something that is a temptation to all of us. 
And so a more orthodox or canonic idea of self would be something self is a, a relational being that there is no atomization that indeed yes. myself is constituted right now in my relationship with you and all the all the beings in my world yes yes and that fits with that idea of god is love and if you live in god god lives in you and and uh that involves love of neighbor. Uh, so, the, you know, the two key ideas, the, the great commandment is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and in doing that, you are living in, in the triune God. Because, uh, well, uh, let, me, let me back up just for a moment, say a little bit about the symbolism of the triune God. I think it's very relevant here. Um, I think it all begins with, a, a, with Jesus's experience uh, and exactly how that, what that experience was like for him, we will never know. But what we have in the New Testament in all four of the gospels is we have a story about how at his baptism, he heard or someone else heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit descending like a dove and resting on him or abiding on him. And that's the heart of the symbolism of the triune God. So I, I think of that symbolism as really originating in Jesus's experience of realizing that the breath of divine love breathed into him from the source of all it is, uh, is forming him as a son, forming him into the sonship that Israel is called to. So there you have the source, Father, you have the spirit, which means breath in, 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 in Latin and pluma, breath, in uh, or wind in um, uh, in Greek, uh, that's God's life, God's life, which is love, breathed into you uh, and forming you from from within. Uh, and with that realization comes a temptation. Uh, and I think it's really it's very significant that in um, well two of the Gospels, in Matthew and Luke immediately after the, the baptismal uh, experience, uh, Jesus is, goes off into the desert and is tested, uh, uh, tempted to be, actually the word more properly means tested in Greek. Um, uh, and the test involves uh, power. Yeah. Uh, uh, being ruler of the of the world, uh, being uh, able to work miracles, uh, these are tests that he's that are put to him by Satan, uh, and uh, Jesus re, uh, passes the test by by refusing these things, and I, I think that that is, is very significant. I, I exactly what happened with regard to. Uh, whether this experience of his actually took place at the time of his baptism or not, I don't know. But I think the story actually reflects an experience of his that he told people about. And the story of the temptation reflects the experience of his reflecting on, if I am this son of the Most High, <clears throat> does that make me somebody who is exalted and powerful or, you know, who ought to be obeyed by people and things like that. And uh, he uh, passes that test. And I, I should mention, by the way, that when the West changed the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, this was uh, uh, done uh, by Charlemagne at a, um, officially at a council in uh, uh, Frankfurt uh, in the early ninth century uh, to 
the, the spirit proceeds not just from the father, but from the father and the son, uh, that when Photius, the patriarch of Constantinople, found out about it a few decades later, and he wrote a treatise uh, called The Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, in which he talked about what's wrong with that. And what he focuses on there is the story of Jesus's baptism, uh, the spirit descending and abiding on, on Jesus as compared with the Old Testament prophets to whom the spirit would come and then go, ephemeral, but abiding on him is the key thing. Uh, and uh, I remember one of the things he says, uh, that Photius says there in that, that book is um, uh, Christ means anointed and the unction is the spirit. Uh, so uh, the father anoints the son with the spirit. The spirit comes from the father and abides in the, in the son. When uh, Charlemagne changed that, uh, part of the motivation, well, you know, you've seen in my book, uh, In Search of the Triune God, it, his real motivation was to, to change it so that he could say, we have the only true creed and those guys in the East, they, they all have a defective creed. Uh, and, and so they're not even proper Christians. They're all heretics. And so therefore, I'm the true emperor of the Roman emperor instead of the one in Constantinople, who uh, they had a continuous uh, uh, descent from the ancient Roman emperors. And, and they can still consider it the Roman empire. They didn't even, by the way, the word Byzantine is a word made up by a... Um, um, I think it was in the early 19th century German historian. Uh, they didn't call themselves Byzantines. They called themselves Romans. Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in the Eastern tradition, we are, you say it's, it's kenosis. So the self- yeah, Which means emptying, yeah. Yes. And so as... As, as a member of the faithful of the church, we too go through a self-emptying, which is yeah. rules related. Which, by the way, I'd say is, some, is pretty much the same thing as the uh, anatta, uh, the no-self of the Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, an opening uh, that, that takes place when you're no longer um, constricted by this idea, this this self that you have to fight to defend and promote. Yes. And that enables relationship. Yes, that's right. Because uh, that kenosis, uh, the, op the emptiness, opens you to the inflow of the divine breath, the spirit. Uh, by the way, uh, though, in connection with this, there's a wonderful image in Plato uh, that I think illustrates this really well. I learned about it from Bowdoin years ago. It's in the laws. Um, the Athenian stranger talks about how um, human beings have, are pulled by various forces. Um, and he refers to them as the iron cords of the appetites pulling you this way and that. But there's also the pull of what he calls the, the golden cord uh, which is the pull of noose, uh, which means uh, intelligence, uh, the, which is pulled upwards by Zeus, uh, the supreme god. Uh, it, and, but in order, to, it's, a, it's a gentle pull. Uh, and in order to even be able to detect it, to be able to be aware of it, you have to resist the pull of the iron cords of the passions and appetites uh, that pull you, uh, that grow out of that egoistic self, uh, uh, seeking to grasp everything to itself and, and, and make itself powerful. And so the contemplative tradition then would be so much more important because in order to hear that that more gentle, quiet voice, I have to become still within myself. That's right, yes. Yeah. And I, I say that's really the key thing in the spiritual life is to, to become aware of, to be able to focus your attention 
on that golden cord, uh, which I would call, from the Christian point of view, that breath of the divine love flowing into us and, uh, and forming us if we let it. Uh, by the way, Maximus the Confessor it, it talks very nicely about um, the, the spiritual life as something that has to begin with asceticism. Asceticism being you're resisting the iron cords. Yeah. But then gradually, as time goes on, you need less and less of, of, to focus on resisting those uh, iron, the pull of the passions and appetites because they don't pull you as much. Uh, they are a kind of addiction in a way that, that, you, can, okay. uh, that you can recover from uh, if you simply let go of them. But you have to, you have to abstain uh, until they lose their power over you. Uh, so that your spiritual life is one of a kind of gradual recovery from the addiction to the passions and appetites. And that, and of course, it's a gradual self-emptying, which allows um, the, that inflow to become something that's more prominent in your consciousness. Uh, you can attend to it. You can be really aware of it. And, and it, I'd say, you know, you don't, you don't have to think of it as something dramatic. Uh, I remember Eric Vogelin, for example, during, when I was, you know, going around with him uh, to, the, uh, to these various meetings with faculty members, uh, we met with some sociologists, and one of the sociologists, um, uh, he, didn't like, he didn't like the word transcendence that Vogelin was using. He said, what do you mean by transcendence? And Vogelin said, have you ever asked a question and you wanted to know what the true answer to that question is? Uh, that's transcendence. You're reaching beyond yourself. You're reaching beyond what you know. You're reaching beyond your preconceptions, even if you might have to have your preconceptions shattered. If you really want to know what the truth is, that's transcendence. And so going back to the golden cord or the orthodox uh, in your chapter, uh, the aftermath in the East, you start talking about how in a kind of, um, in the spiritual anthropology of the Orthodox, there's something, this, this activity becomes located in the heart. That, that, that there's, it's not just a mental thing, it becomes a, a heart thing. A, a, I think oh, yeah. I've seen the term cardio cardionosis. Yeah, you know, I, I could say in connection with that, that the, uh, the Greek idea of nous uh, involves the heart as well as what we think of as the, the mind. Um, it's a word for, it's translated mind, but it is more comprehensive. The Western word mind tends to be thought of as a kind of calculating function. Um, uh, 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 you know, in one terminology people use these days, a very right uh, or left brain kind of thing. Um, and uh, uh, in, in the East, uh, noose involves um, more than just that kind of logical calculation. Um, you know, it reminds me of um, uh, Antonio Damasio's book, uh, Descartes' Error. Uh, do you know that book? I've heard it, 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 it's very worthwhile. Uh, Descartes had the idea that the, the, the mind is th this logical calculating function. Uh, and it's, it's, it's connected with us um, through the pineal gland, perhaps, but uh, his idea was that. But um, uh, it, it's this purely calculative kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it doesn't involve feeling, it doesn't involve uh, anything except pure calculation. So that a, re a really good thinker would be a person who uh, was not affected by feeling in any way. Uh, and uh, Demacia does a really nice job of demolishing that idea uh, be 
he talks about, uh, there was a guy named, uh, oh, Phineas something, I've forgotten his name right now, but uh, sometime in, in the 19th century, uh, he had a, he, had, he worked uh, 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 blowing things up and that involved having to put uh, explosive uh, in some place and, and, and pound it down with a, a, a rod, a metal rod, uh, and then uh, ignite it and uh, blow things up. Um, it was a connection with building railroads, as I remember. Uh, but one day uh, he uh, maybe hit a little too hard with the, um, uh, the rod and it, the explosion took place and blew the, the rod up through his, right through his head, uh, through the brain and took out uh, the part of the brain that connected the brain's functioning with the, uh, the body's feelings. Uh, and uh, he could, con the, the guy, uh, you know, he, he recovered and uh, his mental functioning was just fine except for one thing. Uh, all he could do was calculate. Uh, he could never make a decision about anything. Wow. Uh, wow. He, he could never know whether he was satisfied or not with his thinking. Uh, <clears throat> And Demacia goes on in that book to talk about how the endocrine system is a very important part of our thinking. Uh, the, the entire body, we, we think with the entire body. Uh, you never know whether you're satisfied unless you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And so in some sense, the orthodox spirituality is about fostering and enhancing, cultivating the relationship between the intellect, we'll call it, and the heart. Yes. The effect of knowing and the calculated function. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, the, the hesychastic uh, method of prayer, which uh, Palamas defended against, a, a, by the way, a very interesting case of a, of a Greek Orthodox monk from Southern Italy in a place that was still Greek speaking part of Italy, uh, went to Constantinople and uh, tried to become uh, a major intellectual influence over there. But he took with him a Western pattern of thinking and he, he denounced what the, you know, the whole idea of theosis and, and uh, what the monks were doing. Uh, and uh, um, uh, well, Palamas was uh, uh, selected by the monks of Mount Athos to represent them and, and uh, they had debates um, then in Constantinople, it ended up with uh, a council uh, deciding in favor of um, uh, the monks and Palamas and their the Eastern idea of spirituality. Um, and, and part of the, the, the practice uh, of the Hesychastic prayer involved uh, focusing your attention in your heart. And then linking that to the breath. Yes, yes that's right. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's, um, you know, there are many people in the world of recovery who have spent, it's to this day, a lot of time with the Jesus prayer. People that are non-denominational otherwise, it's a common contemplative practice that seems to, um, you know, meditation may be too difficult initially, prayer becomes kind of rote, and then the Jesus prayer is this thing that can bring you into a more contemplative state. Um, so it's been there, it's been in Alcoholics Anonymous right out of the gate, people oh. practicing it. Mm -hmm. It's quite remarkable. Well, this has been really, really, really wonderful. Um, I'm sorry it took us 25 years to, uh, to reconnect. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you invited me. Yes, and I'm sure our audience will be too. Of course, there's nothing I love talking about more than these, this, these ideas, really. Well, I can say that, you know, It changed, working with you changed the trajectory of my life. And so um, I'm, I'm so, I'm so pleased to hear that. By the way, I, something else that pleased me very much was a friend of mine, the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry at um, Seattle University told me that he has a friend who's uh, 
uh, Greek Orthodox who had, uh, uh, well, sort of lapsed um, his faith, uh, but he, he, who read my book and said that it, uh, uh, it changed his life, and restored, his, uh, restored his faith. I don't doubt it one bit. Yeah. Well, with that, um, thank you very much. And I will, I'll be reading the Vogelin book next, I guess. Good. I, I think you might enjoy it. Really, there's a lot there that's of great interest, I think. I'm sure I will. I learned so much from him. Well, thank you. You're welcome.